Kia ora, hello and welcome to Eastview Baptist Online. We're glad you could join us. And this of course is our first week in Level 2. I hope you're enjoying a little more freedom. And as you know, while we can meet up with friends and family in small groups, we still all can't meet together as a church. However, if you do need a visit from someone from Eastview, just let us know. And now is a great time to physically check in with the people in your house church if you can. We don't know when we'll all be able to meet together again, so let's not lose those connections we've built up over the past weeks and now hurry to get back to meeting in the same building. This week we're continuing our series on Nehemiah, so we'll hear from Rachel in just a little bit. But first I want to read some scripture that will hopefully remind us that there's no reason to rush back into being busy. We can't earn or achieve our way into heaven. Frantic activity is not the way to Jesus. And he tells us this in Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Good morning, everyone. This morning we're continuing our series on Nehemiah, starting from chapter 2, verse 9, through to chapter 3, verse 32. Grab your Bibles and feel free to pause our video right here while you find Nehemiah 2 verse 9 so we can read along together. When I came to the governors of the province west of the Euphrates River, I delivered the king's letters to them. The king, I should add, had sent along army officers and horsemen to protect me. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard of my arrival, they were very displeased that someone had come to help the people of Israel. So I arrived in Jerusalem. Three days later, I slipped out during the night, taking only a few clothes with me. I had not told anyone about the plans God had put in my heart for Jerusalem. We took no pack animals with us except the donkey I was riding. After dark, I went out through the valley gate, past the jackal's well, and over to the dung gate to inspect the broken walls and burned gates. Then I went to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but my donkey couldn't get through the rubble. So, though it was still dark, I went up the Kidron Valley instead, inspecting the wall before I turned back and entered again at the valley gate. The city officials did not know I had been out there or what I was doing for I had not yet said anything to anyone about my plans. I had not yet spoken to the Jewish leaders, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or anyone else in the administration. But now I said to them, you know very well what trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. Then I told them about how the gracious hand of God had been on me and about my conversation with the king. They replied at once, yes, let's rebuild the wall. So they began the good work. But when Sanballat, Tobiah and Geshem the Arab heard of our plan, they scoffed contemptuously. What are you doing? Are you rebelling against the king? They asked. I replied, the God of heaven will help us succeed. We, his servants, will start rebuilding this wall, but you have no share, legal right, or historic claim in Jerusalem. Then we hit chapter 3. Hit pause on your video right here and take a quick look at this chapter. Now, I don't know about you, but when I opened today's reading, my first thought was, really? Really? A long list of boring names? The whole of chapter 3 is nothing but names. Let's just say I was not that enthusiastic about this being today's preaching topic. But then I started to look into the book of Nehemiah more and doing some investigating and now I am genuinely stoked that this is today's passage. I think it's incredibly timely for us as we move into level two of the COVID-19 response. But before we get to the reasons for that, I want us to look together at the whole context of Nehemiah. You do not get to share a home with John Emmett and not know that context is key to understanding scripture. 
We're going to look at a video by the Bible Project team that provides a great visual overview of the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. You'll remember from last week that Robin told us that these were originally one book, and this is important in our understanding of what the author was wanting to portray to his audience. It was a revelation to me some years ago when I began my studies in theology that when we read historical books of the Bible, they often record people making mistakes. I often read these parts of scripture and couldn't understand why God wanted people to do certain things that were recorded. They just didn't make sense to me. But when I grasped the genre of the text, in these cases being historical texts, I was able to understand that they recorded what actually happened rather than only what God wanted to happen. And usually that meant a mix of people getting it right and people getting it wrong. The book of Nehemiah is just like this. There are examples of God's people getting it wrong and falling short of God's glory, but there are also parts of what occurred that we should celebrate and emulate as great examples of what God wants us to be doing. One very clear example of that is what Robin taught us last week. We are to go through life the way Nehemiah did, relying utterly on God through prayer, but also getting up and actively doing the work of God's people, prayer and work. Now, some of you may know that I am an oblate of a Benedictine monastery in Australia. Our motto is just that, ora et labora, prayer and work. As we look into the text this morning, let's do it with a critiquing eye, looking intently for what we should avoid replicating as well as what we should aim to emulate. At this point in time, the walls and gates of Jerusalem had lain in ruins for around 140 years, since Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed them. This was not a new state of affairs. Quite possibly, two full generations of people had lived in Jerusalem without these walls and gates, and had become quite used to things being this way. There was no sense of urgency to rebuild. 140 years is a long time to leave things this way. I wonder how many residents of Jerusalem were asking what the big deal was when Nehemiah started pushing to rebuild the walls. They'd lived quite happily with the current state of affairs. This is going to cost them time, money, resources, and why bother? Can you imagine an outsider coming into Auckland and telling us that we need to change something that we had quite happily lived with for 140 years, and that we need to do it the work ourselves to change it? I don't doubt that many of us would be saying, who are you to tell us what to do? Take a look at chapter 2 verse 19. But when Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you're doing, they asked? Are you rebelling against the king? In other words, who do you think you are? We support our king and our king has never needed to do this. Why would you come in here and try to change something we are happy with? How many of us read scripture and want to identify with the heroes? It can be very sobering to realise that the villains of the text are sometimes those whom we more closely resemble. Not always, of course, but it's always worth asking ourselves the question, is there something in me that resembles the mockers, the ridiculers? There have been several times in my life when I've had to examine myself and admit that yes, my attitude resembles theirs. John will tell you that the phrase, don't tell me what to do, slips far too easily off my tongue. Nehemiah's response to the mockers and ridiculers is totally understandable. The God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. Sanballat the Horonite is a Samaritan are people despised for their historical aggression towards God's people, the Jews. Tobiah was an Ammonite official. The Ammonites were a group that initially lived a nomadic existence, frequently fighting with the Israelites, who eventually settled in Moab. Now, while Nehemiah is correct, these people groups have no claim or historic right to the land of Jerusalem. It is interesting to see these people mentioned as having important roles to play as part of God's people. Do you recall the Good Samaritan? 
Can you recall the Moabite woman from scripture who becomes part of the very family tree of Jesus? We get glimpses there of the fullness of the kingdom of God, where all people who follow Christ are welcomed in. Now we get to chapter 3, the dreaded list of people, the boring part, the bit that, let's be honest, we skip over during our Bible reading times at home. When I was thinking through this chapter, I went back to some of the keys of biblical interpretation that we were taught in Bible college, the basics. Who is it about? When did it happen? What happened? And why? It's pretty easy to answer the first three. It's clear who's involved. The names are listed right there. We know when it happened and we know what they were doing, rebuilding the wall. But that leaves us with the why. And not just why were they building the wall, but why did God decide that it was important to dedicate an entire chapter of the Bible to a list of names? Why have we been told who was there? And why are we told who refused to join the work? We have another opportunity here to read this as history, noting what should and should not be repeated by us. Take a look at chapter three again. We have the high priest, along with the regular everyday common folk priests, the people of Jericho, some guy whose dad was Imri, Hassanah's sons and someone's grandson, and then the people of Tekoa, although their leaders refused to work with the construction supervisors. Wouldn't it be just amazing to be immortalised in history as the people who refused to work alongside the others? Not so much. Then we have multiple goldsmiths, merchants, and someone who made perfume for a living as well as the son of the leader of half the district of Jerusalem. And the list goes on. I can't help but think that the point here is that everyone got involved in the work of God. Well, everyone except the leaders of Tekoa, who refused. If we think now about why the majority of these people got involved in the work of God, we can't help but realise that in order to buy into what Nehemiah was asking of them, they had to realise that things were not as they could be. There was work to be done to make their city one that truly honoured and followed God, that stood out amongst the nations as the home of the one true God. God had chosen Israel, and they needed to do the work to be the people of God. In other words, they had to acknowledge what needed changing. I was praying about this section just before writing this, and I was reminded of a time when I was asked to do just that, acknowledge what I needed to change. Now, many years before meeting my lovely husband, I was in a seven-year relationship with another man. We owned a home together. We were weeks away from our wedding. And apologies, folks, you'll have to show me grace here. Yes, we lived together. No, we were not married. And no, I was not a Christian at that point in my life. The wedding was cancelled and I discovered he'd cheated on me with multiple different people over the years. I was absolutely devastated. The whirlwind of cancelling the wedding, losing my home, trying to hold it together at uni while doing my masters was an absolute nightmare. So I visited a counsellor. Once we had developed a good therapeutic relationship, she asked me a question that infuriated me. What was your role in the relationship breakdown? I was appalled and so hurt that she could think that I played a role in this when I was the one cheated on. It took me quite a while, but eventually I came to realize that that question was the most powerful one I had ever been asked. I wanted a new relationship and I needed to ensure I didn't bring any of the bad habits and behaviors of the old into the new. A central tenet of psychology is you can't change what you don't acknowledge. So I had to acknowledge mistakes I'd made that I would not want to repeat. Then I got to rebuild things. Then I was ready for a new relationship. And then I waited years and years for John. <laughs> now, this is exactly what the people in chapter three did. They took a good, hard look at the state of affairs and realized something needed to change. And then they changed it. As we move down the levels of the COVID-19 response, we have an amazing opportunity ahead of us. 
we get to rebuild. We get to rethink. We get to reimagine. What does it mean to be God's church? What do we, Eastview, want to leave behind? And what do we, Eastview, want to rebuild? Your house church leaders will have a, a set of questions now that you guys can ponder together when you're ready. Uh, if for any reason you don't have those or you're watching this separate from your house group, we will post them on the Eastview Facebook page. But I do encourage you, take the time to rethink and reimagine. What things do we need to acknowledge that we might want to leave behind? And what do we want to rebuild? That's it for our service. We trust you've seen or heard something today that has blessed you. Please continue to stay safe and be sensible when you're out and about and meeting with other people. But before we go, we have one more song for you, and it's a new one. So here is Deeper, Deeper Still. God bless you, and we'll see you soon. Yeah.